Thanks a lot, John. Um, you can see I have three words up there that are really important to me, passion, innovation, and irreverence. Um, I'd like to just first start off with a little video so you can get to know me and you can learn a little bit about the, the brand Specialized. I get bummed out if I have to buy something that I know that I could make or know that I could, you know, somehow rig up myself. I come from a big family. I have 10 brothers and sisters. When I was four or five, I learned how to ride my sister's bicycle. I didn't like that it was a girl's bike. One day I heard my dad's old pickup truck come into the yard and I ran out there and in the back stacked as high as could be were all these old rusty frames and wheels and saddles and handlebars and he said, there's your new bicycle. I started to unload the bikes and I started to build bikes at five years old. I'll tell you how I met Robert. I used to go always to the bike stores and I had these new uh, bags, seat bags that I was really proud of and I was sh showing them to the folks in the store and Robert walks by, he's got this big hair like this and he walks by and he goes, oh, those are shit. I go, hey, what do you mean they're <laughs> shit? And Robert goes, hey, I'm a designer. I could do something way better than that. I go, okay, you come in Monday with something that's better than that. For me personally, if I can think about it, if I can get it in my head, I can make it. I built a house. You know, when you build a house, you learn how to do a lot of things. Like I learned how to be an electrician, a mason, a plumber. All these handles I made out of wrought iron. It took me three months to make these doors. I built cars. I can't imagine how many bicycles I've built. I started when I was four or five years old, so times that by about 100 a year. When I went to school, every project that I did, not just one or two, every project revolved around bicycles. It was just like something inside of me had to get out and it had to do with bicycles. A lot of these younger students, they have such a great grasp on the digital side, but they don't have that grasp on the 3D side and working with their hands. The first thing that I make them do is work in the model shop for the first month. So I, I want to kind of preserve the craft of working with your hands. There used to be a time when everybody used their hands, and I kind of see that as going away. You have to find something that you are really passionate about and try to find work in that area because you spend a lot of time in your life working. I've been there almost 25 years, so for me, it's been, it's been my life. My goal when I was in, I think, fifth or sixth grade was to ride 20 miles. So I rode until it was dark, back and forth on our road. Probably took me about three hours. But I did it, and after that, the cycling gave me such a confidence that I could do anything. And I think uh, it's been a real lesson for me in life that if you can think about it and you can set a goal, there's nothing you can't do. So, as you can tell, those three words are very important to me. And I actually have part of my crew back there. I think if you can stand up, there's Ian there, there's Chris, there's Elaine, there's Ron. We have such a fantastic family at Specialized and that's what really makes for great product. We have so much passion, it's unbelievable. You know, it's just bicycles, but when John came to visit, he saw that it's so much more. We are so crazy into innovation. We have a wind tunnel, we have a composites lab, we can make anything. And we're always trying to have fun, so we're always pulling pranks, we're doing things that are unexpected. And I think that's what makes a fun company. Before Specialized, I never lasted anywhere more than about six months, I got bored. And every day at Specialized is a new day because we make it so fun. So this is a picture of kind of our corporate culture. We have so many damn bikes everywhere. There's hundreds of bikes, just to walk through the building you have to stumble over about 10 bikes. Every day we laugh, someone knocks. We always have so many paint samples and new prototypes. 
every day somebody knocks them over and it's like a, a house of cards. And we always blame it on the same person every day. But you can see we have tons of prototype bikes hanging from the ceiling, lots of different things. But the company culture is so steeped in riding. And everybody that's at Specialized comes because they have a passion for racing, for touring, for making things. We have tons of engineers. We probably have 60 engineers. So people think that uh, it's just a bicycle, but it's so much more. This is actually our company car. So I have to tell you a quick story. So one day I was driving to work, and I saw this 1966 Cadillac hearse. And our credo, our motto for the brand is innovate or die. Because we know if we don't innovate, our brand will not stay around. So I asked the founder, Mike Senior, hey, can we get this car as our company car? And he said, sure. And I was able to buy the car for $2,500. We brought it back to our shop. We made this menacing mouth. We've scared so many old ladies with this car. But we've had so much fun. But there's no other brand, there's no other bicycle brand that can do what we do. And it's about being different, and it's about being irreverent, and it's about trying new things. We want to fail more often, because we know if we fail, we're trying new things. If you don't make mistakes, you don't make anything. This is just a shot of, could be a pickup truck in our parking lot. Everybody rides at the company. As a matter of fact, at 12 o'clock, the company shuts down, everybody goes for a ride, whether it's a mountain bike ride, a road ride, cruise around the reservoir, whatever. We live and breathe bicycles. This is actually the founder, Mike Sinyard, and his vehicle. I really get a kick out of this. I love the front bumper with the hands. I think that's really cool. So he was a San Jose State grad in business, and he didn't really want to get a job, so he loved bicycles. So what he did is he sold this van, and he took that money and went over to Europe and brought back over some of the great products that were happening at the time in Europe. And he was able to make money doing that, and he founded the company Specialized. Vehicles have always, always been a really super important part of our brand. We were one of the first companies to actually buy a Hummer and use it for pedestrian use. This was one of our race uh, support vehicles. And these things can four by four. We've kept, come so close to rolling this vehicle so many times. I love cars, always have. Um, this is a replica of a Daytona Coupe. And uh, I love to fiddle. I'm always working on a car project. I love to meld a car and a bike together. A lot of times I'll work on motorcycles and bicycles and try to put the two together. So if you're going to build a car, you have to build a bicycle that goes with it. So this is a GT350 Cobra bike. I love to build muscle bikes. You can't see it, but if you pull that stick shift out, it's actually a bottle opener. So once again, being irreverent and having fun with a bicycle. So we got ourselves in trouble on this one. So in the, in the middle 90s, we sponsored the Soviet Union, the Russian team for cycling. And we said, hey, we'll make a red jersey, we'll make a red helmet, and hey, we have to do an ad. So at the time, Gorbachev was in power. So if you look very closely at his birthmark, it's not his birthmark, it's the specialized S. So, so this is crazy because this was really before Photoshop and all that stuff. I think we spent about $10,000 to have this shot made, and now any kid in high school could make this. But we actually got a cease and desist letter from the Soviet Union. So we took that very seriously. So subsequently, we picked on Bill Clinton after this, which was much easier. This is kind of our design space. So if you look on the wall, you can kind of see our process for design. And if you could look closely at that, you'll see there's all kinds of cars. We are very inspired by cars, motorcycles, beautiful women, whatever. So I miss the green. Does anybody remember the green machine? So I was, too, I was a little too big to have a green machine when I, when I was a kid. So I vowed when I got older I would make a full-size one. So I made two. I made a green machine and a red sled. And we raced these all the time. But I think you have to find something in your life where you can combine work and fun. And I think we have it in spades. 
So this is a side view of our company car, and you can see we have tons of bikes on it. And once again, you know, our motto is innovate or die. And uh, another story, one time we were going down uh, Highway 101, and I was driving this car. We always drove it as fast as we could, which was about 80 miles an hour. And believe me, 80 miles an hour in a hearse is, is pretty incredible. And I came upon this old guy driving this old pickup truck, and he looked in his mirror, he saw me, and he just pulled off the road at full speed. Another problem we had with this car, it, only, it had a very small gas tank. It only had a 10-gallon tank. I guess when you have a hearse, you don't go very far. So we were always stopping and always meeting new people. But it was a great uh, icebreaker. People always wanted to know all about it. And people were always amazed, amazed that, hey, this is specialized and we're a bike company. I always say that uh, I believe that bikes are big people's toys. And this is a muscle bike. It's, uh, it's based on a Dodge Charger. And uh, I actually made a full-size toy box for it. So once again, this is thinking out of the box, no pun intended, but doing things differently. So I grew up on a dairy farm, so I knew I'd always have to make a cowboy bike. And the most important thing about this bike, if you look very closely at the pedal, see that pedal? It's actually a horseshoe. That gives you much more horsepower. Hey, that was funny, wasn't it? No one's laughing. They're laughing? OK. But uh, there is no other bicycle brand in the world that allows us to do this crazy stuff. And even though we do this crazy stuff, there's always one or two little tidbits that come out of this that reach one of our production bikes. So you can see there's also guns on the side, too, if someone gets out of line. So where do cars and bikes meet? This is actually uh, more, of a, more of a sculpture than anything. It's, uh, it's uh, called a tandemonium, and of course it's a tandem. But I have a dream one day that everything that you have in your car, you will one day have on your bicycle, whether it's air conditioning, whether it's heated grips, where, whether it's a motor, whether it's turn signals, all those things. And as a brand, we're trying to get there and get there closer every day. So we're always trying to work with other great companies. And another great company that we work with is McLaren. So if you look at this picture here, it shows a really cool bike. And that's the McLaren Venge that we worked with M McLaren on and developed over the course of 18 months. This is a very expensive bicycle. This bicycle retails for $18,000. But if you want to get one cheaper, I know, know somebody that can help you get one of those. So not only the fastest bike in the world, but we have the fastest rider. That's Mark Cavendish. And he reigns from the Isle of Man, and he is the fastest guy on the planet. And he rides the fastest bike in the world, which just happens to be the Specialized Venge. And then there's some funky car in the back. I'm not sure what that is. So we have a quick video here that we can show you. And this really sums up how crazy we are about innovation at Specialized. You've seen some fun, crazy stuff. But we're just as crazy on the innovation side, so take a look. I work at Specialized Bikes as an aerodynamicist, working on a new development for a time trial helmet. The best time trial helmets are actually more aerodynamic than a bald head. At the speeds the Tour de France guys are going, this is 30, 40 watts. We're talking 10% of the total power the riders are putting out is being saved from these kind of helmets. So they're huge savings. The overall idea is to take what we found to be the best aerodynamics of all helmets we've tested over years and years and years in the TT3 and make that even better due to different head positions, different rider styles, those kind of things.
basically how arrow can we make bowling ball that's sitting on top of your neck. This has been a project in partnership with McLaren, and they're experts at computational work. Of course, they make the fastest cars in F1, and, but the cool thing on this project, whatever we're developing and testing in the wind tunnel, they're also working on in computational fluid dynamics. Computational fluid dynamics is a process that lets us go from CAD to having an aerodynamic prediction within hours of coming up with a conceptual design. Whereas when we go to the wind tunnel, we've got to analyze the results and that process could take days, weeks or months. With the vents that we have on the TT4, we actually doing something different to what's been done previously. So one of the cool technologies they brought in here, there's these gills that we built into the side of the airfoil shapes and it's actually giving active venting the dirty air is used for cooling, so we get rid of the dirty air and that enables the high quality air to stay attached as it flows around the helmet, which keeps the drag of the rider low. So very few products um, have the McLaren branding. You know, to have the, any product that has the McLaren name on it has to have that intrinsically in the design. It has to have you know, the McLaren kind of DNA inside it. With Specialised, the vision was really complementary. Um, I think it's been really, really useful from both sides to be able to correlate CFD and wind tunnel very, very accurately. Uh, now we have that valid tool. That gives us a chance to, to do some exciting new things. To be able to take the tools that we use in the Formula One industry and apply them to cycling was a fantastic opportunity. It's pretty cool to feel like we're getting to such an optimal design to really benefit the riders. The aerodynamics of the TT4 is the most advanced of anything we've seen so far, and it's just the starting point. So you can see what a fantastic partnership that is in how far you can go with something as simple as a bicycle helmet. This took months and months to do, and the end result is the most aerodynamic helmet in the world, but we believe the most beautiful helmet in the world. And also it makes a great billboard. I talked a little bit earlier about always trying to figure out a way to get into the car industry or the motorcycle industry. And this is an example of a bicycle I did that combines uh, motorcycle parts and bicycle parts. And this is a 49cc, uh, basically uh, a motorcycle bicycle that you can ride on the road. And I love the paint scheme on this because it's very old and retro. It looks really fast, but it's not very fast. I think the top speed is about 30 miles an hour. So looks are deceiving. So I wanted to end on this slide, and uh, <laughs> just as you saw how high-tech all the McLaren stuff is, we have to always remember where we came from. And at the end of the day, a bicycle is really just a toy, and it's something that we can do anything we want with it. This is a bicycle here, and I have a quick little story. This is called the Ned Rock, and it's actually a prehistoric bike. Within the bike industry, there's a, a huge discussion of who came up with the first mountain bike. Gary Fisher said he did. Joe Breezer, Breezer said he did, Tom Ritchie says he did, but we know for, for a fact that we came up with the first bicycle. And this is the Ned Rock, and it's 10,000 BC. That's before Cannondale. That was funny, huh? I, I think I better stop while I'm ahead. So thanks for listening, and thanks, John, for setting this up. <laughs>